show once again i am your host james with me as always jeremiah and today we have a special treat for you we have mr jack o'halloran you know former boxer actor you may know him probably from his most famous role as non from superman 2 but and one and one and one well come on now give me a little credit <laughs> but either way mr o'halloran it's great to have you on the show nice to be here guys Okay, so I guess we'll probably start off with a, a couple of questions. Uh, as he said, probably the most famous role you've had is in Superman 1 and 2. Uh, what was it like working on the, with Richard Donner and, I guess, Richard Lester? Like, with the Superman uh, 1 and 2? like night and day. Donner is a brilliant director and Richard Lester is a television director. Okay, so um, I know Superman 1 and 2 were mostly filmed at the same time, but you know, we, most people know the story of how Richard Donner was booted out so to speak and then uh richard lester is brought on to finish it so um well we'll first start with uh how do you think superman 2 would have been different if richard donner had been able to actually you know finish it himself and uh what was your experience like when you worked with donner and so on like what what sort of things did you learn from him compared to what you learned from uh the other guy well, donner donner is a terrific uh, an amazing director i mean it, it, to work with donner is a pleasure you know he he does his homework he's uh he's a he's an extreme professional he's a he's a he's a he's a very nice person he uh he handles people well he he knows his job well um he and tom mankowitz were advocate uh superman people uh they was uh it was just a, it, it was a, it was a pleasure working for him. You know, I, I liked Dick a lot. Um, you know, and what they did to him was totally out of line. I mean, uh, the salt kinds, uh, salt kinds are a bit notorious for, uh, cutting back things and cutting people out of things and, uh, and trying to, uh, do things that they shouldn't do. And, um, I think that, uh, uh, we knew when we saw Lester come on the set that there was something up. And the fact and the, the truth came out that they owed him a picture. They were already looking to cut Donner out. I mean, how do you cut Marlon Brando out of a movie? Yeah, they that cut makes no Marlon sense. Brando out of, out of two because they didn't want to pay him. They had already paid him to do one and two, but uh, they would have had to pay him his percentages of two. And they, they didn't want to do that. They say cut him out of two, and they put, uh, you know, herself in there, and uh, you know, it just it changed the whole. To me, it changed the the complexion of the film to one degree, and then bringing Lester on and letting him put his campiness in there. I mean, the film was so good that it withstood that. It, it still withstood those two things. Had Brando been in the movie, and had Donner finished it. It would have far exceeded two, and Donna would have done three and four probably. Rather than having three and four be the movies we shall never mention again. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you would have had, I mean, the franchise would have been born, you understand? Uh, and probably Mankiewicz may have taken over and directed one, maybe five or six. I mean, they originally planned to do ten of them. Ten? Wow. That was on wow. the plate to do ten Superman uh, and they were going to keep up with the Indiana Joneses and the Star Wars. And, you know, uh, the, it was. Uh, but you could tell by the way that they moved from Shepard into Pinewood and they cut off a whole crew of people because Pinewood had its own crew. And they only went to Shepard and Studios to film the very first days so that they could get Brando on camera so they could go to the bank in Italy and get the money to finish the movie. Uh, I mean, they were always playing catch up and, and that was sad. You know, if you really look at it and you stand back today and you look at the whole production, a lot of it comes to a total reality as to being the way the Saul kinds operated. They did the same thing with the Musketeer movies. Uh, there, there's a law in the director's guild called the Saul kind law because they did the three Musketeers 
And then Oliver Reed and Raquel Welsh woke up one day and they were watching television and there was a, an ad for the Four Musketeers. And Raquel called Ollie on the phone. She said, do you know we did another movie that I don't know about? And he said, I know I get drunk, but I don't think I was that drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they put a, a law in the Directors Guild that you can't use footage like that. What they did was they just they overshot a lot of footage, and then they brought in uh, the, the English actor kid, and they did made it in the fourth Musketeer, and voila, they had another movie. Wow. And there's a, law, there's a law in the guild that you can't do that anymore because of them. So they were notorious. I mean, when we did, when I first went to work on Superman, uh, the days that I was over there uh, meeting Donner and getting together with everybody and, you know, stuff like that, uh, and I saw the crew, because they were already doing the miniature sets, they were working already, you know, before we came on board. They were setting up different sets for it because they had a tremendous amount of miniature sets. And, it was a, you know, they had like three different productions going at one time in reference to Superman. It was a lot of work. And, uh, and, and the crew was lining up to get paid in cash. They wouldn't take a check. And I said to, I remember asking David Tom on the first AD, who I just finished a picture with, uh, with Gene Hackman called March or Die, I said, well, what is going on with this? What's the deal here? It's a $50 million picture. What are these guys doing? He said, you haven't heard about the salt kinds. And I said, well, why doesn't somebody enlighten me? And, and he told me that they used to take people, they would take pictures into Hungary and places behind the Iron Curtain when the Iron Curtain was still there. And they would get everybody there. And then they would turn around and say, well, everybody has to go on half salary because we've, we've lost one of our investors. Ooh, so that everyone could not got a gone, half no. salary. So they did that several times to people, and they tell them either accept that or go home. Well, these guys already turned down jobs. They, they, you know, they they had to stay and work. For, so you know they they did things like that over the past, and you know we went through some things uh, while we were shooting that you know uh, got sorted out on my side. They got sorted out, but I mean, turn stamp, they wound up suing and and some other people and. Uh, it just uh, it was always a turmoil just with them as far as the crew and and the cast and and Donner it was a it was a pleasure cakewalk working you know I mean you had difficulties in a huge picture like that you always have certain things that pop up but in the overall it was uh, I mean it, it, we had a fun time and we were like a family you when you work that long on the picture with everybody it gets to be like a family Okay, so uh, with Superman and with other projects, you've been able to work with some, you know, some of the great actors in Hollywood, like you know, you met Terrence Stamp and Gene Hackman, you know, and you know, Christopher Reeve. You can put there because of his, you know, philanthropy work and so on. So, um, we, maybe I should ask, what was it like working with them, or what are some of the things that you you learned from working with people like uh, Gene Hackman uh, and Terrence Stamp? One of the greatest, one of the greatest pictures I did that, uh, the, the, and the and the man who really taught me the industry was when I did Farewell My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. And yeah, there you go. <laughs> it was the first picture I did. And, and, and we had, and you're talking about a movie where we had uh, uh, four Oscar winners on the crew. You had uh, Dean Televaris who won the Oscar for The Godfather for set design, doing the set designs. John Alonzo who won the Oscar for Chinatown doing the cinematography. Uh, there was Wes Moore's, the makeup people who were Oscar winners and the special effects guy was an Oscar winner. And, you know, and they all come out for Mitchum because of, you know, Robert was an icon and just a, an amazing person to work with. And, it, and in the picture we had, you know, Harry Dean Stanton and John Ireland and, uh, Charlotte Rampling. And, you know, it was just a great crew of people. And, uh, and it was the first movie I had ever done. And Mitchum just took me by the hand and, you know, walked me right down the street. And it was, uh, it was a, a fabulous experience. And uh, it was just sad that, you know, the, the distributor of the film didn't have, they ran out of money. And because it, it was, it's a classic picture today. It's a great little picture, you know. It never really got the acclaim that it had. I mean, Sil Sylvia Miles was in it. Uh, she was nominated. I mean, it was a, it was a great little picture, but it was a great learning experience. I met a great person and a good friend, and uh, you know, and, and it put me into the industry very strongly. 
So, uh, you know, originally you were a, you know, he a heavyweight uh, boxing contender. Was it hard to go from boxing to acting well, as you did? They, you know, it's amazing. They, they, they chased me for years. They, they, uh, they did a picture of the Great White Hope uh, in 1968 with uh, James Earl Jones. And, uh, and I had just, uh, I had just knocked out Manuel Ramos, who was the number one ranked heavyweight in the world. And, and some friends of mine from the East Coast, where I come from in my own world, uh, wanted me to get off the streets and, and go into the movie business. And uh, they made me an offer to do The Great White Hope and go to Spain for six months and all this jazz. And, uh, and I, uh, I I remember going, they flew me out to Fox to see the producer and, and the contracts were all there. Eddie Foy the third put the deal together and the contracts and everything were there. All I had to do was say yes and agree to it. And uh, the producer uh, asked me a bunch of questions and, and told me what he was going to give me and what he was going to do and, and all this stuff. And I said, you know, uh, you, you're not giving me anything. You're asking me to give up boxing when I just knocked out the number one ranked heavyweight in the world. And, uh, and you go to Spain for six months. And I said, you you want to pay me how much? $1,500 a week? I said, I give that away in tips. I said, so <laughs> <laughs> not giving me anything. I said, I appreciate the offer. I said, but there's a there's a guy who just retired from boxing. He's a big, tall, white kid named Jim Beatty. He lives in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and he's got six miles to feed. Probably needs a job. Here's his phone number. Call him up. And the guy said, are you telling me no? And I said, well, I said, you know, I, I really appreciate the offer. And, and oh, God, Eddie Foy was, was, was dying outside the door listening. <laughs> He's I'm dying listening to it. Let's to show you how small the film industry is. Uh, I'm walking down the front steps of Fox, and James Earl Jones is coming up the steps, and he said, Jack O'Hallor. And I said, yeah. He said, wow. He said, is it true what I just heard about you? And I said, I don't know. It said, depends on what you heard. He said, I heard you just told Hollywood to stick the biggest movie they're doing in Hollywood right up their ass. Is that true? And I said, uh, well, I said, I don't know if you want to call it that. He said, I want to shake your hand. I never knew anybody that told Hollywood to go to hell. And, wow. <laughs> and, and we became good friends, you know. And, but, see, I had been pursued by uh, – Steve McQueen was a friend of mine. Steve McQueen did a picture of Thomas Crown Affair in Boston. And mm. uh, I was boxing. So when I just started my boxing career. But when he came to Boston, we took care of him because uh, I had some serious relationships in the street. And, uh, and and we took care of him. And, uh, you know, he and I become good friends. And he, he said, man, he said, you got to come down on the set. I'll get you uh, your, your your Screen Actors Guild card and come to Hollywood and we'll have a lot of fun. And, and God, you'll work all the time and, and all this jazz. And I said, uh, I don't think so. I don't think that business and I are ready for each other. You know, I was doing a lot of different things in my father's world and boxing and stuff like that. So it was uh, a, it was a different kettle of fish. And, uh, so, you know, and he used to call me on the phone all the time. And he, he did a picture called The Thomas Crown Affair. I mean, uh, uh, Towering Infernos. And he called me up and he said, uh, how do you like your name up on the screen? I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, uh, his name in Towering Infernos was Captain O'Halloran. <laughs> I said, man, are you nuts or what? He said, no, oh, man, you got to come out here. You got to And when I turned down. The Great White Hope, he, he said, what is wrong with you, man? We want you to come to Hollywood. You're going to have a lot of fun out here. But I wasn't ready for it. And then when I retired from boxing in 1975, 74, and in 75, I was running. I had I owned a couple construction companies in New Jersey, and I was doing some things. And and um, I got a phone call to, to, uh, to, to see the director about this. Farewell, my lovely picture starring Robert Mitchum, and it was a starring role. And I and uh, and I went up to New York and Sherry Netherlands, and I met Dick Richards, and uh, and I thought the guy was, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. All these people, Eric, uh, Alex Karras and everybody, all these big guys were in there, and they, you know, and I walked in the room, and the guy says, "You're it, you're the guy. Come over here." Blah blah blah. So. We wound up, I flew out and did a screen test. Uh, in fact, Jerry Bruckheimer picked me up in his Volkswagen. He was just beginning in the movie business. <laughs> and, uh, That's kind of cool. And we <laughs> went to Richard Widmark's house to do the screen test, and Harry Dean Stanton was there, and Robert Mitchum saw the screen test. He said, it's either that kid or I don't do the movie. And, uh, wow. And my career, and my career went, was unfolded, you know, and the, 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 uh, so it's all Mitchum's fault. I blame him. 
you know, well, they, you know what we do too. <laughs> you no, know, I, I, they offered me King Kong when I when I did uh, I did King Kong, and uh, and then I they they wanted me to do another movie in the middle of King Kong because there was a break. They wanted me to do a, a picture with Gene Wilder and and Richard Pryor, and I turned them down. I kept turning people down. And they, uh, the more you turn them down, the more they want you. And, you know, I, and I, it was actually I should have done the picture. It was a great little movie. And they, um, they came to me to do a picture of March or Die, which was the same director who directed Farewell, My Lovely. And it was a great cast: Gene Hackman, Catherine Deneuve, Max von Sydow. Uh, there was a lot of great people. In it. And I said, well, it was a big Foreign Legion movie, and we were, you know, doing it in Europe and Morocco and all. And, um, and they came to me at the same time to do the James Bond movie. Uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, Jaws. And, uh, and and I, Cubby Broccoli came over to see me in L.A. And he begged me to do the film. And I said, uh, I didn't like the script. I, I really didn't like the script. And I said to Mitchum, do you think I, he said, do you like the script? I said, not really. He said, then just do the, the other movie you're signed to do. And and I did, and it was the same crew that went on to do Superman. So from March to Die, Gene Hackman, I just went to London to do Superman. And uh, and I just, like, I worked all the time. I, I worked six months on March to Die, and I left. I had a week off, and then we went to London and did uh, Superman. That's kind of cool. I mean, That's like I, a really, I, it sounds busy. <laughs> well, I worked eight months, eight months on King Kong. I got done uh, in August and September 1st. I was doing March or Die, and then I did that till March, and then March, I think around the 15th of March, and then the 28th of March, we were doing Superman. And you know, we just so do you have uh, any regrets turning down the role of Jaws at all? No, not at all. No, I mean, I probably could have squeezed it in and done it. Uh, I could have squeezed in several movies. In fact, there's seven movies that Richard Keel has done that were I turned them all down. It was a uh, uh, what the heck was it? Oh, a Burt Lancaster movie and uh, the Longest Yard and 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 another film. Uh, oh, really? The Longest Yard? Yeah, he did uh, the Burt Lancaster. I mean, uh, Burt Reynolds did the, the 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 football picture, The Longest Yard. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just saying though, you were actually offered a uh, role in that. Yeah, Richard Keel did the the. He was the big guy that played the lineman there. Oh. And, but it was a duncey role, so I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, didn't mm. really take on at all. So I didn't want to get cast in those kind of roles, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like kind of like you wanted to avoid being like typecast. Yeah, and they, you know, there was another movie with uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, and he got mad at me because I turned that down. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> was, uh, I think I might be a little scared want, if Clint Eastwood got. You mad. don't want Clint Eastwood mad at you? Uh, yeah, he's, he's really he's really a great guy, man. He really is a great guy. He really oh, yes. great I, I love Clint Eastwood's work. He, 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 he's, a he's very, definitely very talented guy, man. He's, yeah, he's, you know, he's a brilliant director. He's a brilliant actor. He's not an actor; he's a reactor, which is a big difference. What's the difference between an actor and a reactor? Yeah, please do tell. He, uh, a person who reacts to what you're doing instead of trying to carry the show by acting and and pulling it out of you. Uh, he learned that from Fellini. Charlie Bronson was the same way. You know, they were, they're reactors. They 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 react to situations. Much so I guess a, a way to re relate to it is like, for example, um, we we well, we all like to write here on the podcast. We usually you know write on online on forums and so on. But like I'm one who likes to bounce off other people. Like if another person is writing with me, I can bounce off their ideas better than coming up with ideas myself. And so he's kind of like that. He can bounce off other actors' well, he, situations yeah, rather he, than in other words, it. he uh, instead of yeah, he bounces. He reacts. If you ever watch his movies, his facial expressions and and he got that. Uh, he did it well in in, uh, in the the television thing he did with Raleigh Gates when he played that western. And then he went to Italy and he learned how to do the spaghetti westerns from Fellini. And, and Fellini showed him how to become a great reactor where, you know, a, a scene is set and it's the it's the reaction of Eastwood that carries it off. You know, it's just like nice. when he did Dirty Harry and, and the guy is doing all the shooting and he's laying on the ground and, and Eastwood puts a gun in his face and says, make my day you know he he reacted to the scene he reacts 
he reacts to things and he does it extremely well. I mean, he's, he's a great reactor. You've done, I believe, three movies with Gene Hackman. Am I right? Is it only three that I can think uh, of? Uh, yeah, three. Yeah. So are, are you friends with Gene Hackman? Have you been able to stay in contact with him since I'm assuming since you were on Gene, set with him a lot? Gene, Gene, and I, Gene and I were good friends and I haven't seen him for a while. You know, he married some young girl. We used to live around the corner from each other. Oh, and, wow. And uh, he uh, and his girlfriend lived right down the street from me in Bel Air. And he, I remember when he first started dating her and he wound up marrying her. She's a pianist. Uh, and I, I remember when he went through his first divorce with his wife. And uh, Gene's, Gene's a super guy. He's a real nice person. He's a great technician. He's a great actor. You know, he, uh, he now he's a he's a great actor. He's he's Gene is a, uh, knows every square inch of a set. I mean, he, if you if if he walks on the set and you're a director and you haven't done your homework, he'll walk right off the set. He'll say, "When you're prepared, call me." Whoa! <laughs> and he actually has the backing to be actually be able to do that. Uh, yeah, he's uh, you know he's he's just a a, a tremendous uh, actor who, who who flunked out of acting school. You know, <laughs> he, he well, there you go. in New York. <laughs> he and Al Pacino both. You know, <laughs> he, uh, uh, Gene's just a real dedicated, uh, well well schooled actor. He's a, he's a he's a neat guy. He does his craft extremely well, and he's a pleasure to work with. I mean, I had a lot of fun with Gene. Gene's a, Gene's a good guy. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, you know, moving along with, you know, movies and whatnot, I, I was wondering, you know, what was it like working with, uh, you know, Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks in uh, Dragnet? Good people. Tom was uh, Tom was coming into his stardom days, and, of course, Dan Dan's just an incredible actor. I mean, he's just an incredible uh, – incredibly talented man you know he was a great musician and uh and he's a great writer and he's a great and he's a great actor and he's uh he's a very very talented guy you know dragnet was a lot of fun because Ackroyd was into it man i mean he was so much into joe friday and and uh, and it was a good uh, pair off him and hanks and you know hanks was a great sidekick to him and and they played off each other very well and there were a lot, again, there, you had a lot of great actors in that picture. You know, there was uh, 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 Christopher Plummer, and uh, mm. uh, you know, there were some pretty neat people, uh, Dabney Coleman, and, you know, uh, there were a lot of people in the, in the movie that uh, that rounded out. It was a lot of fun. It was a it was a good production. We had a lot of fun doing it, you know, and, uh, and I played this zany character, Emil Muzz, and, and I kind of liked the role, you know, so the uh, I liked when I can do parameters and stretches. You know, it's like when I did Superman, you know, when I, they offered me the role of Superman, I liked the idea of playing a mute. I always wanted to do that because Jackie Gleason was one of my favorite people, and, and he did a picture called Gigo that he won an Oscar for, uh, and he played a deaf, dumb mute, and he was brilliant. And I said, geez, I'd love to do a picture where you can do facial and body reactions, you know, and make the character come alive. And... And the fact that when we did Superman, you know, Terrence was uh, was this vicious maniac guy of, of, of General Zod, and and Sarah was uh, a man eater, and you know, uh, but all like solid. So somebody had to relate to the kids, and and I played this role of a, of, a, of a, uh, a powerful, powerful person with the mentality of a child, you know. And, and and doing and learning how to do things like a child would, you know. It's just so when I did certain scenes like burning a hole in the side of the truck and in the, in the wood and stuff with a with a kid next door next to me, I did it on the same level as a child and and given the tearing the, the the red light off of the cop car and handing it to Zod and uh, different uh, different things that uh, would relate to a childlike mannerism and it worked very well. Actually. Yeah, I always did like that scene with with the uh, with the cop car. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, so I it, guess one it came off pretty well. It did it really came off well. Plus, I mean, also you know with Dragnet um, working with uh, Tom Mankiewicz again. Yeah, Tom's a sweetheart. He, Tom was Tom was a very talented guy. He's a very very good writer, and, and, uh, and his whole family. I mean, it's a family that's been in the business for years. His father was in the business, and you know the Mankiewicz family had been around for. They were writers, and Tom was a great writer. And then he became a good director. I mean, he was uh, he was tremendously helpful to uh, to Donner on Superman, and uh, and then he fell into his own when he when he directed Dragnet. 
Yeah. So I guess uh, one one follow up with Superman. Um, you know, we know there's Superman three and four, but no one really considers them sequels to Superman two because they'd rather you know forget they existed. Um, so most people say the true sequel to Superman two is the 2006 um, Superman Returns. Did you get to see Superman Returns when it came out, and what did you think of it as a follow up to Superman two? I, uh, I I thought that they uh, the the script was weak. Uh, I thought they, they, for all the money they had, they could have done something much, much better. Uh, I didn't like the fact that they changed, uh, they took out the American way. They, they, they changed the costume. They, they, they used too much CGI. I mean, they had some great talent in the movie that it had nothing to do. You know, you got a Frank Langella in the movie and you give him a weak script and you have a, uh, Kevin Cos- uh, Kevin Spacey, and you give him a weak script. I mean, it was a it was a terribly weak script, and you know, I just uh, I didn't like the way they 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 made uh, Lois Lane out to be like a hooker. Yeah, you know? yeah, I, I I had that thought too. I'll be well, honest. Well, I mean, with you. it was it was kind of diabolical what they did, and and they they they, they did so much CGI, and, and you know, the kid Roth actually had a great look, mm. but. They, he definitely looked like. Oh, me. he had a great look, but they the changing the costume was a bad idea, and and they never really let him uh, come out like Christopher did. Christopher, well, you you'll never find another Chris Reeve like he did Superman. Chris Reeve just, is Superman. He had it down to the nines, and uh, the, the, I, I doubt we'll ever find anybody to replace him. I understand this new kid. Has a great look, at, at, you know, and he's a, and he's a pretty talented actor, uh, and I hope he pulls it off. But I, they have to give him the material to work with, you know. Oh, uh, referring to uh, the new movie, Man of Steel, out, Man Man of Steel. Yeah, the new one that's coming yeah. out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. Well, I would love to see the franchise rebirth, you know. But uh, they, I mean, it's amazing. Here we did a picture that is like 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, and we, um, the the movie still today plays better than it did then. I mean, it just carried because we broke a lot of technology rules. You know, we uh, we did things that uh, uh, were never done before. Uh, we didn't do all CGI, and we didn't do a lot of blue screening. We did we did the flying shots. And we did what they called Vista Vision on Vista Vision, which was a very difficult and tedious deal where they had a huge 70 foot screen and they put these pole arms through the screen with body cast at the end of the pole arm. And we laid in them and they dressed us and we're like 70 feet off the ground looking down at the concrete floor. And they shot us in the film. They shot Vista Vision on Vista Vision. So all the flying shots were flying under bridges and around buildings and everything. We did. There was no wires or anything. You, you. I mean, you looked like we were actually doing it. So they they made some technical giant steps in the Superman two. The fight scene was brilliant. You know, if you look oh, yeah, at the yeah. fight scene, it was just it was absolutely brilliantly done. That, you know, that was, fight scene was awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was brilliant. I mean, there, there there's that was flying into the Daily Planet. We actually, they built a set on set, and we had tracks in the ceiling, and we were on wires, and we flew right into the building. I mean, it was it was absolutely phenomenal, you know. Oh, that's that's uh, too cool. <laughs> and and the, the things that we did were were just uh, were great, you know, wrecking the Daily Planet and stuff like that. You know, it was a uh, uh, we we broke some technology rules, and and the picture stood up and stands up today. To show just how well it was made by Donner, you know. Oh yeah, no. Well, you know, just uh, touching on that subject for a minute. Do you think that films today are are relying too much on CGI? Yeah. Yeah. I think they overdo it, and I think they're uh, the, the the problem with the problem with Hollywood today is that they're trying to remake everything because they're not allowing creative people uh, do their job, mm. and, uh, and 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 you know when you. When you uh, try to shortcut and stuff, and uh, they there's no necessity for for doing as much CGI as they do. Uh, it's it has a time and a place, and it's a great technology. And used properly, you could enhance a great film and make it greater. Uh, but 
you know, when you overdo it, uh, it gets very phony looking. Yeah. And you can see through that, you know, you just sit there and say, wait a minute, this isn't realistic. I mean, God, you know, it's, just, uh, I mean, that's what was wrong with the Superman movie. I mean, it, it, it just, it got so overbearing. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. Some of it was just a tad weird. <laughs> Well, I know I, I personally really liked Superman Returns, but I thought it was a very reverential return to what Superman 1 and 2 were rather than... Well, they could, have, they could have done a much better sequel. On the True. That. And, you know, we had, uh, we, had, we had offered them some great ideas for doing a sequel where, um, where we would have come back uh, out of jail and stuff, you know? Ooh, and, out of the Phantom Zone. Uh, yeah, and just, uh, I mean, we were... I mean, we actually shot footage... That, that was never seen where we were put into police cars. You know, you see us fall down into this cavern and that's all you ever see at the end of Superman too. But we shot footage with Donner where they put us in police cars and took us off. We had lost our powers, you know, and I said to them, you know, I, I could have went to jail and, uh, and because I lost my powers, I could have went to college and become an educated guy. Learned how to talk, and, and you know we could have come back in a whole different genre deal and all that stuff, and uh, we could have done a pretty neat sequel off of two that we had done, uh, and we there were a lot of great storylines that were thrown around, and, uh, and these guys, um, the, the 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 young director that directed it that did the uh, X Men movies or whatever the other film, yep, did. Brian Singer, Brian, he um he just had this. Flippy idea, and I, I, I don't know. I just, um, I thought that uh, I thought it was a very weak script. I really did. Well, I'll say one thing for sure: his idea was better than what Tim Burton's idea was with that weird, white and gray, shiny space Superman suit. Oh God, that was weird looking. But the the new Superman, Man of Steel, looks as of right now, you know, has a good cast. You know, has you know Christopher Nolan's helping with it. It has you know Henry Cavill as Superman, Amy Adams as Lois Lane, Michael Shannon's General Zod. Um, Russell Crowe as Jarrell, Lawrence Fishburne's in it as Perry White, Kevin Costner's in it, Diane Lane's in it. So it looks it has a good cast, and so I just hope they pull it off. Well, they, they, you know, they it, it's all about the script. You know, depends on yeah. where they go with where they go with the story. And I would love to see them rebirth it. I really, really would. Boy, I mean, yeah, I, and that's what they're doing. They're redo it. They're rebooting. They don't even have uh, John Williams' theme. They're using Hans Zimmer instead to do music, which is going to be weird. I think I think it's going to be. Uh, I, I mean, I, I truly hope. I, I hope that they they really do it well. I, I I would love to see it happen. Believe me. Oh, I love Superman. So I hope they I hope they pull it off. Well, it's an so, American uh, icon, you know. Oh, for sure, it's Superman. It's the Man of That's Steel. It. Though it is ironic that Superman was the last hero to finally be cast by a foreigner, because you know Batman was cast by you know Christ, uh, Christian Bale's British, Spider Man was cast by a Brit. Henry Cavill's a Brit. <laughs> oh well, here's bound to happen. Best act, let the best actors get it, I guess. Well, you know, I just, uh, well, I guess it just will remain to be seen. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. It, yeah, that's so, one of those things. We're just gonna have to wait until it comes out and pray to God. Yeah. So you had a, a pretty good um, acting career. You had a good boxing career. So what are you up to now in Hollywood and well, we're getting in uh, we're getting ready to build one of the largest studios out here. Uh, which is going to work extremely well and it's going to be great for the industry. Uh, we're building a, a major, major film studio in Long Beach, and uh, and it's going to work out really well. And uh, and then I've written a book called Family Legacy, which um, will make The Godfather look like a child's game. It's a pretty good book. And, uh, Can you talk to us about this book a little bit, like what it's about? Or yeah, I had a I had a very uh, well. You're from New Jersey. What are you guys are from New Jersey, right? Uh, yeah, I'm from New well, Jersey. I, I had I a kinda. very I had a very very famous father called Albert Anastasia, who uh, oh, was was yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> we're uh, we're doing uh, I'm doing a story from the inside out, and we're going to tell the truth about a lot of things and. And the book, uh, the book takes place. The first book, it's one of a trilogy of books I'm writing, and the first book takes place from my father's death in '57 to Kennedy's death in '63, and we tell the truth about the Kennedy death, and we tell the truth about several other things that happened in between, and and it reaches around across the country, and we're going to uh, we're going to make a trilogy of movies, and then we're going to do a television series that will go back and start. 
the opening of the country and show how industry, uh, government, uh, or organized crime and unions were partners for a lot of years. They all worked together, and a lot of illicit money that was made, Meyer Lansky and people like him it reinvested it in the major corporations in America, and were actually part of the growth of the country. You know? Wow, that sounds fascinating. So, yeah. would this be um, made in the studio you're building now, or? Well, we're uh, we're probably uh, yeah, we'll probably make it. I don't know. We have we we're waiting. Uh, we have a famous, famous director that uh, that uh, we're just waiting for the final uh, go ahead with him. And if he comes on board, which I believe he's going to, uh, the the film will be unbelievable. It's just gonna it's going to uh, uh, it's going to re re like uh, you know the Godfather was a great landmark, and uh, this will be uh, another step above that in the same genre and it because uh, it'll be uh, it'll be real there'll be a lot of people the real names will be used Meyer Lansky Frank Costello uh, Charlie Luciana and uh, uh, a lot of the stories will be uh, unfolded and uh, you know there's there's just a lot of uh, it's going to be a lot of fun actually there's a lot so of so are you allowed to tell us the director you're going after uh, I think uh <laughs> uh, it would be uh, well. We're, we're we're looking. We're talking to Francis Ford Coppola. Awesome! Oh, and, wow. Uh, I believe. Uh, I, I believe in my heart of hearts that uh, that he'll do it, and I think that uh, uh, it, the deal will work out. And and if it does, then uh, it, it's going to be the movie will be huge. It'll be great. Finally, get him to do something big again, rather than the, oh, yeah. the little tiny yeah. films he's been doing yeah. for a while. Yeah. And this is like a last hurrah for him because uh, he would get involved also in the series, which uh, would be awesome. You know, the, it would. Uh, I mean, it would make uh, the Sopranos look like a little boys' game. You know, it would be very good. Well, him and his generation of friends are all retiring now. Like, you know, even George Lucas just retired, and you know, that whole generation of filmmakers are going away. Yeah, and, and once Spielberg retires, you know, the entire group's gone. Well, you know, he's uh, Francis is is, is 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 kind of a unique individual, and, a, and a, he's a great director. You just have to give him the genre that he really excels in. You know, mm. I mean, uh, when he did Apocalypse Now, he he went way beyond what people ever thought could be done in reference to Vietnam, and that um, was a great movie. Oh yeah, I mean, it was brilliant. I mean. Uh, when you look at uh, Brando in that movie, and, and Brando was like 400 pounds, they had to use another body and put his head on it. <laughs> it was so <laughs> big. It was so big. I mean, he just. Uh, but the performance was just was amazing. You know, Charlie Sheen. Uh, I mean, uh, Martin Sheen was brilliant, and it was it was just a great picture. You know, but there was a lot of controversy and a lot of a lot of perseverance getting it getting it done. And he stood there and he did it. You know, he went through all the trials and tribulations, and um, and he and he backed it. He financed it himself. He hocked his vineyards and everything because of his belief in what he was doing. Uh, so you you have to, you know, you have to give full measures to a man who believes that much in 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 what he does. And if I can get him in that kind of a mode to do this, bro, oh, we're gonna have a ball. And when you get Coppola, you know, you know he has so many contacts and friends everywhere. You know, his daughter is a famous director now. He has contacts, of course, as we said with George Lucas and ILM, Skywalker Sound, all those people. He has Spielberg. He has writers. He has, he's a he has all sorts of friends you know, everywhere. Francis is a very respected man because he's, uh, you know, like I said, he's his own man. He's, Francis is the man's man. You know, he, uh, he, he finances his own projects and he's, uh, he stands behind himself very well. He's, he's kind of unique. A unique individual. I kind of really have a lot of respect for Francis. Yeah, yeah. Especially with Apocalypse now. I mean, because, you know, most people, you know, today, they're like, oh, well, I don't get it. You know, controversy and making it. I mean, you got to understand when the movie was made and then oh, what yeah. it was about. And then yeah. you realize it's only that far removed. Uh, it's a, it, I mean, it's a classic in its own right. And then oh, the yeah, is another classic. So. You know, Francis has done a few classics in his life already, you know. <laughs> uh, so getting him to, to do another one would be, uh, and, and if I got him involved, then he would probably stay involved for the three books we're going to do, which would be a, 
a great hurrah for his, you know, for his life. You know, it would be that'd terrific. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it'd be great. So uh, we're gonna start wrapping this up now. So I guess one one final thing we'd like to do is uh, we're gonna give you the soapbox. We're gonna give you you have the opportunity to promote or any anything you want to promote, anything you want to to try to tell our listeners about. You have an opportunity to promote whatever you'd want to do. Toot your own whistle. Yes, I, I, I would like to actually, uh, I think that the farewell, I mean, uh, Family Legacy is a great book. And I think people, where they can get it on Amazon. Uh, the, the film is going to come out. We're going to make it. And uh, I think that it's a great read. If you guys uh, uh, will send you a copy of it, you love the read. The read's brilliant. And it's just, I have never, it's a five-star rating on Amazon. Uh, everyone that's ever read it just flips over, you know. We're having a lot of fun with it, and it's, uh, like I said, it's the first of a trilogy, and uh, I, and I can't wait to do the movie, and I really can't wait to do the series because we can tell so much more truth about the the birth of a nation and how things have really changed and why they've changed, and uh, I mean, it's uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun. We really so, are. It's. Well, I was gonna say, so it's kind of like this is kind of like. Uh, Okay, we know you're going to enjoy it, but like, here's the real story. You want to know what really happened? Here's what happened. Yeah, absolutely. It's See, and that's story, what's cool. It's a story told from the inside out, you know, and it's uh, it's it kind of makes it unique, and uh, and it's a great read. I mean, it just happened. The book turned out very well, and 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 the second one will be even better. Uh, so we're uh, we're 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 having a lot of fun with it, you know, and I can't wait. We get uh, Francis on board, which I believe we will. And uh, once that happens, then it'll be all over the place. So you guys are the first ones that have ever that I've ever told who's actually coming on board to, to direct this thing. Wow, Bombad wow, Radio that's... exclusive. So wow. hopefully, hopefully it works out. It looks pretty good. We'll see. You know. And uh, when we see the more announcements for the movie, we'll we'll work on getting you back on to talk more about it, so that we can get more more updates and expand, you know, what we know with the listeners, because they'll be just as fascinated as we were, because this is, well, this is fascinating. Uh, and well, I, of course, check out the book, folks. I mean, yeah. Amazon.com. And I got to tell you, Jared, nothing personal, but I think more so for me than you, because like from the area that I live in, that I grew up on, because I was originally born in New York City. You know, okay. and then grew up in New Jersey, and you yeah. know, just from being from this area, that's just like the whole concept to me is like, wow, I, I have to, I want this. Yeah, yeah. My father lived in Fort Lee. He lived in Fort Lee because they couldn't <laughs> lock him up there. He used to go across the George Washington Bridge. Yeah, I gotta <laughs> read this book. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah. It's kind of you'll like it. You'll enjoy it. You live here from Jersey. You will definitely enjoy, enjoy yeah. it. I guarantee it. This is up my alley. <laughs> oh yeah. It's family legacy. I'll tell you what. You write down. I'll give you a site. The site is really cool. It's got some great information. It's called. It's a HTTP, you know, semicolon slash slash www.familylegacythenovel.com. I'll have to go check that out. Yeah, write that down, folks, and check it out. Yeah, the site's really kind of cool. It's it's pretty good. It's got some really neat stuff on it. Wow. All right. Well, we'd like to we'd like to thank you for being on. This has been fascinating. We'd love to hear about your life, and we'd love to have you on again, um, probably a little closer when your movie's coming out, and see what more we can learn because you have a lot a lot to tell. And uh, well, it's been fun, guys. I appreciate experience. a lot. I hope I didn't bore you too much. No, not at all. We not we at all. <laughs> we were hanging on every one of your words. Yeah, really. This has actually been probably one of my favorite interviews so far. I can't lie about that. Well, have a great more more have a great weekend, uh, and I hope the, the holiday is good to you. And you, you know, stay out of don't get in too much trouble. We'll try not to. We'll yeah. try not to. And you stay out of trouble too. Okay? Yeah, we're we're away from the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and have a, and have a good day. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. All right, thanks, guys. Take care. <laughs>